This video is brought to you by NVIDIA's RTX GPUs, powering technological leaps like DLSS 3, giving you more frames and smoother performance in games like Diablo 4, Cyberpunk 2077, and more. Click the link below to check it out or stick around to the end of the video to learn more. All right, hello and welcome, Diablo 4 review, let's do it. So first up, a lot of setup for this one, really wanna communicate what the review environment was like and how that influences what this review will and will not cover. So Blizzard did not allow us to level characters on our own accounts, they instead gave us trial accounts and they told us from the start that we would eventually lose access to those characters when the live game launched. Reviewers had about a week with the game before those servers were turned off. I'm pretty sure I was playing on OCE servers, and given that there aren't many of us over here, I didn't see a single other player during my 50 hours with the game. I also wasn't able to do any of the world bosses. I mean, I could have, but they're meant to be done with other people, so I didn't bother. I raise all of this because one of the central differentiators of Diablo 4 is this open world that will dynamically matchmake you with other players. I didn't get to experience that, so I wanted to call it out. Secondly, the in-game shop was not enabled during this test, but Blizzard did provide screenshots and B-roll that do include actual prices. I'm gonna show that to you, but I'm also gonna offer the caveat that I can't guarantee any of this, and it is possible that there are other shitty things on this storefront that we haven't seen yet. Also, you should know that none of the promised battle pass or seasonal content is in the game yet either. That all hits around mid-July, so no review you see will be able to cover that. Most importantly, you should know that I haven't done any of the end game yet. The reason for that is that I knew I would not have enough time to properly assess the end game during this review window. When I review a Destiny expansion, for example, I do that like two or three weeks post release so that I know exactly what's going on and can speak about it with confidence. Having a week to play through this on a character that I knew would get deleted, there was just no way I was gonna be able to properly review that end game beyond just describing what it is, which is what Blizzard have already done in their blog posts and live stream. So for that reason, I spent a lot of time in this campaign. I've heard some reviewers finishing this campaign in as few as 10 hours being around level 40 when they rolled credits. I was 20 hours deep and level 35 when I finished act one of six. So I really, really took my time with this open world, talking to NPCs, doing as much side content as I could and really wrapping my head around the way that all of the non end game systems work. So that is what I'm going to talk about today. And with all that set up out of the way, what do I think of Diablo 4 so far? Honestly, I'm pretty stunned by what's on offer here. I have played all three Diablo games at or near their launch windows. The size of this game on day one, it feels like five times the size of all three previous games put together. The defining aspect of Diablo 4 is its mammoth scale, not just in its world, mind you, but in the length and density of its campaign, the number of itemization and progression systems ready to go on day one, the fact that there is an actual end game ready to go on day one. Previous Diablo games and most looters, in fact, were not shipped like this. Diablo 2's end game was very much about utilizing its excellent scalable progression systems to set your own objectives across PVE or PVP, because the game itself didn't really set clear objectives for you. At launch, Diablo Diablo 3's core gameplay systems were hopelessly underbaked and the entire game was neutered by the Real Money Auction House. That game was not fixed until the Reaper of Souls update, at which point a number of endgame systems came online that can now be viewed as the first draft for stuff that would eventually make it into Diablo 4, stuff like the adventure map and bounties for example. The contrast between those releases and Diablo 4 is staggering. Diablo 4 not only has five playable classes at launch, each of whom has their own expansive skill tree, paragon board, and a range of legendary aspects that augment your chosen build paths, but it also has an open world map so massive that I've explored less than half of it in my 50 hours, and I've unlocked no more than like 20% of its locations, strongholds, and other secrets. Diablo 4 has a campaign that can and will run you 10 to 50 hours, depending on how you choose to play it. It has 120 dungeons, each of which have a nightmare variant and endgame. It has so many fully baked itemization and progression systems that Diablo 4 feels like a game in its second or third year of existence, as though a raft of iterative content updates have already fattened out and expanded this game's core offering. So it's absolutely fucking huge. And on many levels, it's a triumph for Blizzard. This is an extraordinarily dense offering for that $60 asking price. Very few video games that ship this year or any other will offer you this much bang for your buck. However, as much as Diablo 4 is defined by its scale, I think it's equally defined by its lack of innovation and imagination, and also a characteristic that can best be described as over-design. This game is gigantic, but I really struggle to point to a single part of it that feels truly new. There's stuff that's new for the Diablo franchise, like the open world, the approach to side quests, mounts, a very compelling narrative, far more than we've ever seen before. 
But other ARPGs have already done a lot of this, and they've done so while delivering innovations in core gameplay, itemization, and progression that Diablo 4 just doesn't seem to deliver, at least not based on my 50 hours with it. Enemy design doesn't push for anything new. There's 120 dungeons, but they all kind of feel the same. Bosses lack identity or interesting mechanics. The campaign delivers precious few set piece moments that you might recall when you look back on them. The side quests are almost all fetch quests. The random open world events you discover all feel pretty similar to each other despite their minor differences. The list goes on. I also feel as though a lot of the spikiness that makes these games great has been sanded back. And Diablo 4 feels smooth in ways that it shouldn't. The dynamic world scaling means you never feel under or overpowered. It means you never get a drop that makes you feel vastly stronger than you did a moment ago. Itemization has been homogenized to the point where most items are just amorphous clumps of stats and have no appreciable impact on your power or build choices. The ability to craft legendaries with specific aspects that augment your build is a good idea in theory, but it ultimately further erodes the value of drops while pushing you into very specific build paths that become difficult to escape at a time when you should be frequently experimenting with new weapons, stat compositions, abilities, and affixes. There's also some really big challenges with the ability trees, again, pushing you into a limited number of build options rather than encouraging more dynamic build craft. So there are some problems, sure, but bottom line, the sheer scale of this offering and the scale of Blizzard's commitment to it really dwarf those issues. We know that this is the start of a live service journey, and most of the complaints that I have today aren't going to be there in 6, 12, or 18 months. Such is the nature of live service offerings. In many ways, the question for today is, is Diablo 4 worth experiencing despite the shortcomings it currently suffers from? And the answer is, absolutely. Whether it's with the intention of just finishing the campaign and never touching it again, or being in on the ground floor for what will be a multi-year live service journey, Diablo 4 is absolutely worth it, both for what it delivers right now and for the great promise that it holds. Technical sweep first, good news, Diablo 4 runs really well and looks great while doing it. I tested this on two machines, the first was an RTX 2080 Ti running at 1440p, ran beautifully there, very well optimized, rock solid frame rate even when the action was thickest. I did the majority of my playthrough on the RTX 4090 in 1440p ultra wide, which is the footage you're seeing here in this video. My monitor is capped at 240Hz and I was at that cap even with DLSS turned off. The game does offer various DLSS settings, including the new DLSS 3, which would obviously be overkill for now, but Blizzard have confirmed that ray tracing will be added to the game in the future. If you have a decent enough rig, I don't think anyone is going to need to enable any form of upscaling for the moment, but later on when that ray tracing does arrive, it's nice to know that various upscaling technologies will likely give us the headroom to be able to turn ray tracing on. I had zero crashes while playing and only some very minor bugs, some graphical issues where, for example, my character's weapon would constantly disappear so he'd be walking around looking like he's carrying something but you couldn't see what it was. During cutscenes the icons over my minions heads would flash up intermittently even when they were kind of like disappeared from the screen. I had one instance where I could move my character but couldn't use any attacks or abilities so I had to reload the game from the menu. That's about it. It's very minor stuff that's going to get fixed either at or near launch. I will make clear that Blizzard do have a day one patch deploying that plans to address a number of issues they've identified. Overall though, a very solid package, technically speaking. Visually, I really can't get enough of just how good Diablo 4 looks. As I outlined in the intro, there's so much to be said about this game, but certainly one thing you can't fold it on is its art design, its lighting, the density of each of its spaces, it's incredible. I mean, just in terms of art design, this is absolutely a response to the criticism of Diablo 3, where that game abandoned the darker gothic tones of Diablo 1 and 2 in favor of something more stylized and with a more saturated color palette. Here in Diablo 4, Blizzard have said that they've taken inspiration from the old masters, painters working in the medieval period who rendered humanity with a sort of divine sadness. That is Diablo 4 in more ways than one actually, divine sadness. 
Divinity has only ever been a reflection of our humanity, and Diablo 4's art design renders that reflection in brutal, bloody, dark, cruel sadness. The ruined chapels, the carts piled high with corpses, the dungeons decorated with skeletons hanging from shackles, the town centers full of huddled souls trying to scratch out an existence in the bleakness and cold of their war-torn world. I just found this sanctuary to be so immersive, far more than any other Diablo title before it. Each location had such visual density, so many things to see in each square foot of it. I'd often just zoom in and walk around for a bit so I could take it all in better, remarking all of the tiny details that Blizzard's artists have meticulously added to each scene to make it feel more lived in, more ruined, or more horrific. Sound design and music does so much to elevate this as well. Previous Diablo games have all excelled in their unique soundtracks and soundscapes. Diablo 4 is absolutely at the same level as its predecessors, surpassing them in some ways. Owing to the massive scale of this open world, the soundtrack here is by far the most expansive we've experienced in Diablo title to date. Almost every new location has its own accompanying track, with the songs of the capital cities in particular being real standouts that sink you deep into the fantasy that is each of these locations. Overall sound design? Incredible. I remember back when I played Diablo 3 at launch, I wasn't reviewing games back then, so I wasn't thinking about them as critically as I do now. But even then, I was still like, holy shit, this is some of the best sound design I've ever heard. And it was, because Diablo 3 would go on to win multiple awards for its sound design. I expect Diablo 4 to win just as many awards because the range of sounds on display here from character and enemy abilities to environmental detail to the splatter of corpses as they pop under the weight of your onslaught, it's always absolutely glorious and it totally adds to just how satisfying combat is in Diablo 4. <laughs> Foundationally, Diablo 4 delivers a technical tour de force that is sadly not always a reliable deliverable from modern AAA games. This runs spectacularly well, so well in fact that it leaves room for new graphical options in the future. It suffers from only minor technical issues, all of which should be easily fixable. It looks stunning, delivering a visual motif that is a callback to the franchise's high point in Diablo 2. Each environment is full of so much detail, and when combined with the impressive soundscape, Sanctuary has never felt so immersive. I won't lie, the technical side of this game is so strong that it becomes a very compelling portion of the overall package. If you like Diablo and you want to see it looking better than ever before, then you should play Diablo 4. If you are an ARPG fan and you want to see the best looking game in this genre, then you should play Diablo 4. I don't think Diablo 4 raises the bar in too many aspects, but the technology side of it is an unmitigated W. Blizzard have put a huge amount of work into making this the best looking, best sounding ARPG on the market, and I think in this aspect, Diablo 4 absolutely delivers. My children. The Lords of Hell are coming to devour our world. Salvation lies not in the light. Continue. One area where Diablo 4 delivers a massive step up over its predecessors and over the whole ARPG genre really is storytelling. Diablo 1 and 2 both had a story worth paying attention to, but it was a very thrifty form of storytelling. Some incredible cutscenes, a few brief dialogue exchanges, and that was about it. What was there was very powerful and it definitely lit a fire within your imagination, which was important because your imagination would have to fill in a lot of the blanks that the story would leave. Diablo 3 storytelling was a notable step up compared to 1 and 2. It had more story, more cutscenes. It was trying to leave fewer blanks and deliver you something that stood on its own two feet as a gripping narrative that might spur you towards the next destination. The results were mixed, I think. I mean, I struggle to remember the story of Diablo 3 other than Kane's sudden demise. Diablo 3's story is more remembered for the fact that it existed rather than for the specific events that transpired during it. Oh, and for this absolute mad lad, of course. I am Cormac, warrior of the Templar Order. Betrayal can never be forgiven. 
Diablo 4 storytelling is so many orders of magnitude above what this franchise has delivered before that it's difficult to credit it almost. It has more fully rendered cutscenes, one of which is certainly among the best that Blizzard has ever delivered in the entire company's history, and that is a very high bar by the way since Blizzard has produced some absolute bangers back in the day. The story has vastly more dialogue than all three previous games put together, and that's just in the main story dialogue where many locations are peppered with NPCs who will happily give you plenty of voiced exposition through either side quest requests or simple chatter prompts. The game is six acts at launch compared to the previous games which had just four. The first five of those acts are each huge full of new characters to meet and new locations to explore, while that sixth act is much smaller but it's just a relentless climactic push to the finish line delivering some of the best moments of the entire game. So there's a huge amount of story to experience here but the biggest improvement to narrative isn't size, it's quality and depth. Diablo's storylines have almost always been some variation of Big Bad Diablo is back, let's go get him. The villains you fight are almost all one-dimensional demonic baddies. There's very little mystery within these stories. The companions you meet while novel didn't have a lot of emotional depth. All of it was just fine, and I never would have recommended that anyone play a Diablo game just to experience the narrative. But I would actually recommend that people play Diablo 4 to experience this narrative. I would. I don't think it's incredible. It's not going to win an award for best narrative at the Game Awards, for example. But it's dense and thematic and confronting and at times very sad. That sadness comes from the fact that all of the characters in this story now feel so much more real and fleshed out. From villain to ally to even your own character, there's just so much more meat on every narrative bone. The story is centered on Lilith, who calls herself the Mother of Sanctuary because she kind of is. The lore tells us that she made Sanctuary as a refuge from the never-ending war between the forces of Hell and the High Heavens, but Sanctuary has become rotten and she seeks a means to cure it. She is a rare villain in the Diablo Pantheon, and indeed within the broader Blizzard Pantheon. She's purposeful but also delicate, she's ruthless but not uncaring, she has her own emotional baggage that shapes her actions, and she has deep personal connections to many of the characters you'll meet throughout the course of this journey. Lilith is absolutely not the distant, faceless, malevolent, demonic baddie that this series has often delivered. She has so much more than that, and it's truly worth experiencing this nuanced rendition of villainy that Blizzard's writers have spun for us here. But she's not the only star of the show. There are other antagonists who also make their presence felt at various points, giving the proceedings an air of mystery that is genuinely compelling as you peel back layer after layer. There are companions you'll recruit, each of whom have their own stake in the unfolding drama, each of them playing a pivotal role in deciding Sanctuary's fate. Then there's you, the player character. You have lines and you say stuff. It's not much, but it's definitely enough to establish a sense of who your character is and how they see the world. It's just enough to make your character feel like a proper character without being so much that it might rob us of the sense of role playing that comes from playing through these sorts of games. I suspect some people won't love how much the main character talks, but personally, I was into it. Where this story shines the brightest though is, ironically, in its darkness. This is an oppressively bleak story, one that finally feels as though it matches the promise inherent in a game centered on an endless war with hell itself. Diablo has always been about fighting the primevals, fear, hatred, and terror. But those words mean nothing except in the way they are manifested in human hearts. Diablo 4 is the very first time we've seen that mortal manifestation, the way that evil grips the hearts of human beings as they slowly slide into demonic servitude, the dead-eyed brutality of human beings as they betray each other, sacrifice each other, bludgeon each other to death. As I said in my preview, seeing horned demons doing terrible things doesn't really evoke much in us, but seeing all the terrors that actual human beings are capable of is far more chilling and far more affecting. For that reason, Diablo 4's story hits really hard. It's not all perfect, that fifth act really drags to be honest, but the rest of it is pretty damn solid and I found myself more invested in this story than I've ever been in a Diablo game, and frankly, in any Blizzard game since Starcraft 2, Warcraft 3. The piecemeal narratives of Overwatch and World of Warcraft do contain really powerful stories, but the way they're delivered makes it hard for them to have much of an impact on you very quickly, some of them can be rolled out very slowly. Diablo 4 is this immediate hit that really does harken back to the golden age of Blizzard narrative and lore. If you're wondering whether or not it's worth picking up Diablo just to experience the campaign alone, so setting aside all of the endgame stuff, then yeah, absolutely, for many reasons in fact, and certainly one of the most compelling of those reasons is just to experience this story. I've never been able to say that of a Diablo game before, but you can absolutely say it of Diablo 4.
By far the biggest change that Diablo 4 delivers to the classic Diablo formula is its static shared open world. On the whole, the addition is a very welcome one, but this is certainly a very safe and dare I say vanilla take on what an open world sanctuary could have been, and the density of its checklist style activities may exhaust some people. Previously, Diablo games were not like this. The towns and some tentpole locations you visited were all static, but the space connecting each of these locations was procedurally generated in an instance that only you could see unless you invited people to your game. Now, the sanctuary that I see is the same one you see. There's no procedural generation in this overworld map that's all been relegated to the 120 dungeons peppered throughout it. Sanctuary is a finite, persistent space with set topographies and landmarks, each of its secrets hidden in the same place for everyone. I do think that something has been lost by trading away the procedural generation of the overworld map, but on the whole, I think the trade has been worth it. When you stepped out of town in previous Diablo games, you were forced to find a path forward by exploring. You had no idea if the entrance to the next area was north, south, east, or west, so you just had to push into the unknown, hoping to find it. That wasn't a particularly deep or satisfying form of exploration, but there was something in it. It could result in you pushing into a space you wouldn't otherwise need to visit, finding some random monster spawn or an event that could result in your next big upgrade. That discovery was more about unexpected combat encounters rather than the physical space itself providing you something worth finding. That's why I think the trade-off here in Diablo 4 is worth it, because with the move to a static world, Blizzard have been able to intersperse interesting secrets throughout it, making the process of exploring Sanctuary's reaches more rewarding than it's been before. What are those secrets? Well, it's actual towns full of NPCs to chat to and side quests to pick up. It's quest givers out in the wild who have some small or big ask of you. It's statues of Lilith, each one providing your entire account with permanent stat upgrades. It's shortcuts connecting two portions of the map in unexpected ways. It's those dungeons, each of which house crucial upgrades for you in the form of legendary aspects. And perhaps best of all, it's strongholds, locations under enemy control that you need to liberate opening up new fast travel, vendors, quest givers, and usually a dungeon or two. If it sounds a bit checklisty, it definitely is, but I don't think that's a bad thing here. Diablo 4 has a specific menu that tracks your regional progress, allowing you to tick off every waypoint unlocked, side quest completed, and stronghold liberated. Cynically, you could be like, oh, look at all this open world, busy work bullshit. But to be honest, when it comes to games like this, we don't really need much excuse to play more of them. And ticking off this checklist is actually a really satisfying loop that actually helps ground you within what would otherwise be an overwhelmingly massive world. And that is the ultimate saving grace of this move to an open world, its size. It is fucking huge. Like I said at the top, 50 hours in and I've explored less than half of it and completed only a fraction of those regional checklists. Sure, I could have done a lot more in those 50 hours if I just run through every zone to see it or focus exclusively on hunting for regional secrets. But the way I played the game, moving slowly through the campaign, exploring the world as each part of it unfurled before me, doing as many side quests as I could. Yeah, man, 50 hours does not get you far in Sanctuary, I promise you that. This world is really gigantic, on a scale that I don't think anyone is fully prepared for. I would estimate that a meandering playthrough that aims to tick off most of what this open world has to offer, that's gotta be at least 70 hours, which is just an absurd amount of time if you compare it to any previous Diablo campaign. Hell, it's absurd if you stack it up against all three previous campaigns combined. So there's a huge amount of real estate here, and there's tons of stuff to discover and do. The obvious follow-up question then is, is it good? On the whole, it's fine, but like a lot of the rest of Diablo 4, I think it's pretty safe and I think it really feels like an amalgamation of previous ideas rather than anything truly new. I mean, location design is a perfect example. This is a pretty massive space, but very little of it is stuff you haven't seen before. It's the familiar ruined ramparts and creepy cellars and swampy morasses and dusty desert dunes that the franchise has delivered multiple times before. It's nice to see that stuff return because it's part of the Diablo DNA but there aren't many new locations to expand that DNA. The one standout for me was this very brief shipwreck section where you're fighting your way through these decaying men of war. Really awesome location that stands out because it was kind of the only truly new feeling space I was moving through. For a map this large to be so devoid of new settings was a bit of a disappointment. What about those statues of Lilith that you click on to unlock permanent account-wide upgrades? I mean, they're neither here nor there. We play Diablo games to click on demons, not statues of demons, but who can say no to a permanent stat buff, right? Side quests are an area that became more of a disappointment for me as time wore on. At first, I did find quite a few of them to be interesting. One of the early ones in Kyovashad was a real standout, actually. A chain quest that involved exercising a demon that continued to find new hosts. It was always a simple showdown encounter, 
the narrative dressing around it really sold it. Over time though, I began to realize that most of the quests you'll do involve some person who's missing and can you go find out what happened to them? Spoiler alert, they're dead and probably a demon that I need to kill twice. There's also a lot of fetch quests like killing X number of bugs to collect bug wings or whatever. Again, it's fine because we don't need much of an excuse to play these games. But does Diablo 4 deliver an interesting fresh take on what the video game side quest can be? Absolutely not. The random events that appear throughout the open world are, I don't know, there's not much to them. Like other parts of Diablo 4, they have a very homogenized design quality that make them all feel rather similar to each other despite their surface level differences. Obviously, there's only so far you can stretch this formula given the genre, I get that, but the random events don't come anywhere close to butting up against the limits of what this genre might be capable of. They're almost all set in very small locations. They never ask you to move around the map. Most of them involve killing a thing by interrupting the three or four things channeling into it. There's some damage gating. Sometimes there's some NPCs to be kept alive. That's about it. Again, it's stuff we've well and truly seen before, either in Diablo 3 or in other ARPGs. It's fine, don't get me wrong, but not a lot of imagination has gone into what these events could have been. These are definitely not random events 2.0. I think the most disappointing aspect of this whole game are the dungeons, which is a big problem actually, because the end game is largely based around nightmare variations of these dungeons. So dungeons are peppered throughout this world. There's 120 of them, and they're all either immediately unlocked when you find them, or you unlock them by completing a prequest or liberating a stronghold. Dungeons are curated spaces in that they have a specific design aesthetic, specific enemy types that spawn within them, and they have a specific boss. They are basically the only part of the game that is procedurally generated. And that is a shame because the structure of dungeons really neuters the impact that the procedural generation might have had. Almost every single dungeon involves some sort of runway towards a locked door. Unlocking that door involves completing one of a very limited set of objectives find two keys and then bring them back to the door. Kill three blood growth things that are keeping the door closed. Kill the four key wardens, etc. It sounds fine as I describe it here, but when you're 20 or 30 or 40 dungeons deep, this very predictable structure starts to feel very sing-song. The dungeons are not surprising in a way that procedural generation might typically allow for, because you know you're always going to be splitting off in two different directions to complete two very predictable objectives, which will then see you backtracking to the locked door so you can face off against the boss. It's a structure that makes a lot of sense on paper, but in reality, I actually think it's a massive step down versus the previous approach to these sorts of locations. The bosses as well, they are in a similar boat, I think. I don't exactly know how many there are because I saw some repeated bosses across dungeons, but I'm going to guess there's at least 30 or 40, which is a good number. The problem is that most of them feel quite similar to one another, typically just some basic avoidable attacks followed by a damage gate, some ad spawn, maybe some channelers to kill, rinse and repeat three or four times and you're done. Again, in 50 hours, I can really only think of one or two bosses that truly stood out to me for their unique encounter design. For what it's worth, the nightmare variants of these dungeons at endgame are kind of the pinnacle endgame activity, similar to the scaling rifts we saw in Diablo 3. You'll continue to up the level of challenge in these dungeons, and new modifiers will continue to make things more difficult for you. Having not done these yet, I really can't say how much more enjoyable these dungeons become, but I know that the overall structure and boss design for those dungeons remains the same, so I know that at least some of the core issues with dungeon design persist into the endgame. So those are some of the pros and cons of this open world and the things you'll find within it. But I want to contextualize all of this by saying I like a lot of what Blizzard have done here. And I'm excited to step back into this world when the full game launches. The sheer scale of this world and the number of things you can do within it really work for this type of genre. Where as I said earlier, you're just looking for any and all excuse to keep playing. This world gives you plenty of excuses to keep playing, be it the main quests, side quests, random events, upgrade statues, strongholds, dungeons, or just the simple pleasure of seeing the fog of war dissipate and a new section of the map be revealed. All of that stuff is there, and all of it is enjoyable to varying degrees. At the same time, I do think that a lot of innovation was sacrificed at the altar of scale. With the need to create so much real estate, a lot of it does feel familiar. With the need to have so many random events across that real estate, most of them start to blur together. With the need to have 120 dungeons and at least 30 or 40 bosses, most of them feel quite similar to one another. Blizzard obviously arrived at a set of core design templates for most of Diablo 4's activities and then looked to deliver minor variations on them so they could be replicated at scale. Had Blizzard aimed for a smaller world with a smaller number of locations, events, side quests and dungeons, they might have had time to innovate more ambitiously. One 
thing I did not mention about the open world is that it scales dynamically to your level. Regions do have a minimum level requirement, but after that they will scale to whatever level you are. So if you're level 40 and you step into a region that had a minimum level 30 requirement, that region will be level 40 when you get there. Really not a fan of this, to be honest, and I think it does some pretty dire things to the overall feeling of progression and experience as you play through this campaign. One of the biggest reasons we play looters, particularly the campaign components of them, is to feel that feel when a sick item drops and it's like, fuck yeah, let's go. Big massive stat increases that result in you feeling way more powerful than you did just a moment ago, making old stuff feel way easier and making you strong enough to face something you couldn't face before. Diablo 4 does not give you that feeling ever like ever even when i got some massive new legendary upgrade with tons of big stats and a top tier aspect perfect for my build i kind of just felt the same as i did a moment before the scaling that is at work here is so aggressive that it completely robs you of a feeling that i think is central to these sorts of experiences people might say well better that we have an open world that scales so you can go anywhere right and like maybe but i don't know i don't think so i don't think diablo 4 is a better game because i can do act 3 before i finish act 1 and if it means i have to sacrifice those massive itemization power steps that have been the bread and butter of diablo for years then i think that's too great a sacrifice from a power and progression perspective Diablo 4 is actually one of the least rewarding ARPGs I have ever played, and that is a real bummer. It's an issue that's reflected in the overall approach to itemization as well. One of the biggest issues with Diablo 3's gear was that it would drop with misaligned stats, so you'd get unique barbarian weapons with tons of intellect on it, for example, which is totally useless. Blizzard would go on to rework that system in Reaper of Souls such that items only drop with stats that were useful to your character, so you wouldn't get intellect heavy items if you were playing as a barbarian. Well, Diablo 4 takes that a step further by making all core stats useful to all classes. So the warrior will get some resistance for every point of intelligence and the sorcerer will get some armor for every point of strength. There is still incentive to focus on your class's core stat, but since all stats are broadly useful to you, you don't find yourself really thirsting for items stacked with your core stat in the way that you once did. Similar things have happened to secondary stats. There are so many secondary stats in this game, like over a hundred and that's because each class now has this huge raft of secondary stats that can roll on items that drop for them i mean for the necromancer i can get a secondary stat that allows me to inherit more armor from my golem a stat that decreases my damage taken if i have debuffed a target with shadow damage a stat that increases damage dealt to enemies who have over 80 percent of their health a stat that increases the damage dealt by one of my skeletal warrior types but not the others the list goes on and on and on to the point where there's no way that anyone could hold all of this in their mind, let alone hope for a drop that has the actual secondary stat on it that you want, because when the pool is this large, the chances of you getting what you want become infinitesimally small. So what does that result in? It means you kind of just don't worry about secondary stats all that much. You don't really feel their power anyway since the scaling is so aggressive and there's so many of these stats that trying to chase any one of them is pointless. So you kind of just put on whatever might increase your overall strength and survivability. And if the secondary stat helps, then that's a bonus, I guess. That is a really stark contrast from Diablo 3, where secondary stats were the most powerful stats and you could immediately feel their impact on your build. During the campaign and into endgame, you were really looking at each and every drop to see if it would fit in your build. And if it did, you could immediately feel its power impact. None of that exists here in Diablo 4's campaign. And given the way that this item economy is designed, I really wonder whether these issues will persist at the endgame as well. So between the scaling and the disappointing secondary stats, the value of powerful, exciting drops is greatly undermined, but it's further undermined by Diablo 4's approach to crafting and legendaries. I was actually rather surprised to learn how all of this worked actually. So the dungeons that you do each unlock what are called aspects. Aspects are essentially legendary affixes that you can apply to your gear. So you can take a rare yellow item and turn it into a legendary orange item by applying an aspect to it. These aspects really vary wildly in terms of how powerful they are. On the lower end of the spectrum, I might have one that increases my damage reduction by 10% if I have seven or more minions active. But at the more powerful end of the spectrum, I found one aspect that increased the attack speed of all my minions by 40%. And as someone that was running a minion focused build, 40% is a lot of attack speed. That is an aspect that I unlocked permanently and that I could easily apply to any weapon that I found. And so because I never found anything more powerful than that, I just kept putting that on every new weapon I'd find, meaning that I was kind of just using the same weapon throughout most of my playthrough. 
These aspects can be applied to every single slot, mind you. Weapons, armor, rings, amulets, and the costs to do so are not particularly expensive. So by about level 35, you don't actually care what items are dropping, except in how they might serve as raw stat sticks to fuel your next application of a legendary aspect. In that moment, Diablo 4 moves from being a drop-focused game to being a crafting-focused game. And that doesn't really work for me, to be honest. I want totally random drops that not only provide sudden power spikes, but also prompt me to radically redo my build. With how much agency I have over legendary aspects, I actually found myself specializing in one specific build and kind of just sticking with that because all of the legendary aspects I'd accumulated all kind of piled up on top of each other to the point where it would have just been too much work to redo all of it and try something new. The lack of incentive to experiment with buildcraft is further exacerbated by the skill tree design. So first of all, I want to say that I really love how distinct each class is in a Diablo game, including Diablo 4. Many looters offer variations on a theme when it comes to a character class, a lot of it being determined more by your weapon and ability choices than by the core class fantasy. Diablo 4 has five very deep, very immersive class fantasies that each stand totally distinct from one another, with vastly different playstyles, abilities, and visual design. I mean, even the world reflects this class design, as you'll visit the birthplace of necromancy during the campaign, or a tribe of druids will ask you to prove yourself before being allowed to address their chieftain. Class really matters in Diablo games in a way that it matters in few other games, and Diablo 4 really nails that as well. I also think the classes are fun to play. I spent 20 hours on the rogue and 50 hours on a necromancer, and I've definitely enjoyed a lot of what these classes have to offer. The rogue is an interesting ranged melee hybrid. It's quite demanding to play in terms of speed and positioning requirements. The necromancer is a lot more passive, letting his minions and his corruption do the work while he stands back. So while these classes are fun, I think there's only a few ways to properly play each of them. And the way the skill trees are built really shuttle you into those builds, both subtly and overtly. It's difficult to fully explain in brief, but the long and the short of it is that you have 58 talent points to deploy across the skill tree, though the majority of those points go towards very minor upgrades for your core abilities, giving each of them like, you know, 5% more damage per power level. There are some leftover points that can be put towards passives that buff your core abilities, but most of those feel very compulsory given your build choices. So if I'm choosing to run Skeletal Minions and Golem, of course I'm going to take the 16 passives that buff minion damage, because if I don't do that, then I'm kind of an idiot. The other build pathways all do something similar, pushing me into a number of very obvious, basically mandatory skill and passive choices. All of this stuff is again in stark contrast to Diablo 3. There you had a huge number of core skills, each level up gave you access to one of those skills or to a powerful skill rune that would profoundly augment the nature of those skills in very core ways. It wasn't just like, this thing now does 5% more damage, which is what Diablo 4 skill tree is based on. It was like, your bowlers now explode targets. Oh wait, not anymore, now they electrify them, etc. It was a really good system that Diablo 4 unfortunately steps back from. To be clear, the Paragon board here in Diablo 4 is attempting to do some of that heavy lifting, as some of its nodes do provide more transformative impact, but most of the Paragon board is bonus stats. Having said that, I have not spent proper time with this, so I can't yet comment on how much it's going to impact overall build craft. What is clear though, is that the Paragon board is for endgame, and if you are someone that only wants to play through the campaign on one or more characters, Diablo 4's item economy and sense of progression feels like a pretty massive step back versus Diablo 3. It's all very well designed, full of systems that guide players towards obvious goals and make it really easy to reach those goals. But I don't think games like this should feel that way. That's what I meant at the start when I said Diablo 4 feels over-designed, that it's lost its spikiness. Its dynamically scaling world is frictionless in a way that robs you of that feeling where you're underpowered one moment and overpowered the next. The secondary stats are so numerous and yet feel so pointless. The ability to easily craft and recraft legendary sounds great on paper, but it ultimately diminishes the value of item drops and quickly shuttles you into narrow build choices, which the skill tree was going to do anyway by virtue of its very restrictive structure. Diablo Force classes each have so much presence and identity, both in your hands and in the broader world, but it does feel as though the skill trees and itemization systems that service those classes are just a first draft one that will likely be redrafted significantly within the context of the live service delivery model. That's a bold choice. And that brings us to the $100,000 elephant in the room. 
Wait, sorry, that's Diablo Immortal. And that brings us to the $28 skin in the room, live service. So as I said at the top, the shop front was not enabled during this review. Blizzard did provide B-roll and screenshots for at least some of that storefront though. None of it is particularly surprising. There's a currency you can purchase. The more you spend, the more bonus currency you get. There are skins and bundles which range in price, some as low as around $8, the most expensive one currently being $28. But just look at the fine print on this. Notice this design does not look particularly elaborate. It's not full of insane particle effects. It's pretty restrained, right? Blizzard will absolutely add some legendary or sacred edition skin that will cost well above that $28. That is a guess, but I will eat my Destiny 2 hoodie if I'm wrong. In addition to this, Blizzard will eventually sell the Battle Pass. It'll be $10, but you can also buy a more expensive version that skips a bunch of tiers. Pay to not play the game. You know the drill at this point. Most importantly, Blizzard have said that they will not be adding any pay to win elements to their cash shop. That's fine for now, but always take those promises with a grain of salt because most of the time, executives who don't give a fuck about video games end up breaking them anyway. Plus Diablo Immortal exists, so we know where Blizzard's compass is on this stuff. I know that a lot of people are just noping out on Diablo 4 because of this whole live service thing. Worry that the base game will nickel and dime you and that it's gonna be all about the battle passes and the FOMO and the dollars spent, etc. I wanna be really clear about this and it's a point I made in the intro. Very few games that release this year will offer as much bang for buck as Diablo does for that $60 or $70 asking price. You're talking about a campaign that will run you 10 to 50 hours, an open world that'll take 70 plus hours to fully explore and clear, an end game with at least a solid 100 hours of content before you hit the hard progression and itemization cap, and then you get to do all of this again on another character. I estimate that there's at least three to 500 hours of gameplay here for anyone hoping to hit the max level on all characters. All of that is yours without having to spend a single penny on any of the live service stuff. It is very rare that any new release AAA game is able to offer you 500 plus hours of gameplay for the base asking price. I would also say that I personally am actually quite interested to see what a live service Diablo looks like for quite a few reasons in fact. First and foremost, I think this is the type of game where a seasonal model fits rather nicely. New enemies, story beats, items and combat challenges being added at regular intervals. It just makes sense for a game like this, right? Furthermore, I'm interested because the Diablo team have been doing this for a while now. Diablo 3 was a live service in all but name, so this team has had a big run up to this moment. They are not going in unpracticed and unprepared, and that itself is very encouraging. Finally, and I think most importantly, what an incredible starting point for a live service. Most live service games that launch fucking suck. Most of them just die in the ass in their first week or month, having launched in a hideously underbaked state, crushed under the weight of their own ambition. Diablo 4 is one of the greatest, most feature complete live service launches in the history of video games. It offers a robust game that is functional and feature complete. It has an actual end game ready to go on day one. It has seasonal content ready, launching in as few as six weeks. What other recent game can you say that of? Like Genshin Impact is the last one I can think of actually. And that game went on to become a multi-billion dollar phenomenon. Do I expect the same for Diablo 4? I don't know, but I do expect it to be very, very successful. There's plenty of stuff within Diablo 4 that I'm not a huge fan of, particularly when it comes to stuff like itemization and class design. But to be honest, it's almost like those complaints don't matter because they will be addressed. That is what happens when you stand up a live service. You build this thing that is not only able to roll out new stuff, but it's also able to absorb and respond to feedback. One of the best parts of Diablo 4 is the knowledge that it's going to get bigger and better. But what Blizzard can be really proud of today is the fact that what is already here is very good. This may not be the innovative giant leap forward for the ARPG genre that previous Diablo games have been, but it's a very solid foundation and there could be no better starting point for Blizzard as they begin the task of imagining what the future of this genre might look like. For that reason and many others, I recommend Diablo 4. Big marquee games like Diablo 4 are often a good excuse to upgrade your rig. So how's your GPU doing? Getting a little long in the tooth maybe? Well, if you're thinking about upgrading, you probably want to check out the range of Nvidia 40 series GPUs. There's lots of reasons for that actually. You might just think it's about the raw processing power of the GPU, and it is, but it's also about the unique cutting edge features that only Nvidia GPUs can offer. Features that give you a massive performance increase and unlock all new graphical settings for the games that you love. But yeah, if it's raw grunt you're after, then Nvidia's 40 series GPUs are no 
no slouch in that regard, offering more raw processing power than any other consumer GPU on the market. It's the additional features where Nvidia really leaves the competition in the dust. DLSS3 is the perfect example, and it's a feature actually supported by Diablo 4. Now, DLSS3 is a cutting edge tech that uses AI to generate additional frames between the natively rendered frames. When I was playing Diablo 4 at max settings, 1440p ultra wide, I was getting an absolutely rock solid 240 frames a second when playing that game, which is the maximum number of frames that my monitor can render. That is insane, especially for a game as visually dense as this. That's gonna matter a lot when Diablo 4 eventually adds ray tracing, a feature that Blizzard have promised is coming post launch. That's a feature that models lighting like never before, resulting in the most detailed lighting you've ever seen. Cyberpunk recently added a new ray tracing overdrive mode that's exclusive to Nvidia 40 series cards, and it is remarkable, making one of the best looking games look even better. When ray tracing eventually arrives for Diablo, not only will you be able to enable it thanks to the RTX 40 series GPU, but you'll also have headroom enough to run it thanks to the performance uplift provided by DLSS 3. DLSS 3 is also supported by Nvidia Reflex, which significantly reduces input latency. When playing a game like Diablo 4, where you're constantly dodging incoming enemy attacks and targeting distant foes, you want the fastest possible response time so that when you click, your character does what you want them to. Nvidia Reflex helps with just that. There are tons more features that make Nvidia 40 series GPUs the clear best choice for your next upgrade. So if you'd like to learn more about them, hit the link below in the description or pinned comment. Bottom line though, if you want to play games like Diablo 4 to their fullest potential, a 40 series GPU is the best way to do it. That link to learn more is below. Thanks Nvidia for sponsoring the video and thank you for watching it.